competition today has made it very difficult for us as judges because there were so many great ideas and so much creativity. It reflected one thing about all of you and something that will make all of you a success. And that is you put in hard work. The winner of BCC 2018 is Likens, Delhi Private School, Dubai. Got a good idea of what our previous challenge was like, and I hope you're excited for this year's competition. I would now like to introduce our game master, Mr. Daniel Atkins. Mr. Daniel Atkins joined the Transnational Academic Group Middle East in 2009 as a faculty member in the schools of business and information technology and has led the organization for the past seven years. Dan has spent the first 20 years of his career working in the IT industry, providing services for companies including IBM, Dell, Clorox, Philips, Hershey's, Coca-Cola, Merck and Visa. His roles included programming, quality assurance, auditing, project management, security, disaster recovery, and business process re-engineering. In addition to being a management consultant, he has held numerous management positions, including CIO and CEO. Before coming to the UAE, he has worked extensively in the, U in the UK, Vietnam, the United States, India, and the Philippines. He has started several businesses and has worked in multiple successful startups. Dan holds an MBA and postgrad certificate in business research from Harriet Watt University, along with numerous professional certifications. It is truly a pleasure to have you with us over here, sir. Over to you. Thank you so much. So the BCC is something that is very important to me. It's uh, something we actually started nearly a decade ago now, and we have continued to grow year on year. We started with, I believe, about 150 students in the first one. Uh, there are nearly 1,800 students registered for this year. It's the largest BCC we've ever held, and I am... Um, thankful that you've all chosen to be a part of it because this year's BCC is on the single most important topic in the world, and that's sustainability. When Ms. Everill was introducing me, a uh, couple things she didn't mention. I was at one point academic director for the sustainability program for a university here and was teaching into environmental sciences. And I have been going out and doing public lectures on environmental causes and sustainability for nearly 15 years, uh, including uh, doing some on stage at the Dubai Mall, for example. So I've been all over. I've been on radio on this. So this is a cause that is absolutely near and dear to my heart. And as the CEO of the organization, I have been working very hard to really drive the entire organization toward greater sustainability. Uh, you may notice, you know, we all have our metal water bottles and uh, we're trying to be a, both a plastic and a paper-free campus. And it most certainly is reflected in how I live my personal life. I am a firm believer that the most important challenge that the world is facing right now is around the environment and is around a sustainable future. And I want to apologize to all of you. I'm 54, so my generation is a large part of the problem. We mess things up and our parents, the boomers, mess things up. And unfortunately, they left you holding the bag. See, they're going to be, you know, my parents will be long dead by the time we hit the climate point tipping or climate change tipping points. And they'll be long dead by 
you know, 2035 to 2040, when MIT was making predictions about potential societal collapse because of environmental issues and resource issues. So they screwed it up. My generation screwed it up. And we left it in your hands to fix. Now, as human beings, one of the things that you will notice is we're not good at doing things we should do, but we're good at doing things we have to do. Think about maybe last January the 1st. How many of you made New Year's resolutions probably that had something to do with eating better, sleeping better, exercising more, having better study habits? Any of those ring a bell? Uh, how many of them made it past February? <laughs> okay. We all know that these are things that we need to do for our long-term benefit. But unfortunately, as humans, we tend to do only what we have to do. Well, your generation is the first one where fixing the climate and fixing sustainability in the world went from a need to to a have to. Your generation absolutely has to do it because the consequences of 200 years of people not doing the right thing are coming back to your generation and you're going to be the ones who have to deal with them. So this is why this is such an important topic to me and this is why we made this the theme of this year's Business Cup Challenge. Okay, so let's talk about this BCC and let's start off with setting the scene and I already did a little bit with the MIT survey but if you've been following the news you've probably seen the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change they released their 13th report this last year and for the first time they said we're in a code red for the first time they unambiguously said human beings are causing global climate change and we already are committed to passing some tipping points. So all of you have ridden a roller coaster at some point in your life, right? You're going up the hill, up the hill, up the hill, everything's fine. And then all of a sudden, enough of the cars have gone over the hill that it goes. If you think about a roller coaster, the only point on the roller coaster where additional energy is being put into the system is when you're going up the hill. Once you tip over, you're not stopping. You're going to go. We've run into that. When it comes to temperatures, the IPCC has calculated that if every country does what they promised to do at COP26 in France, we will hit an increase of 1.8 degrees Celsius over where we were in the 1800s. This is what the temperature charts look like and the consensus of the temperatures. Now you might be thinking, yeah, no, two degrees, right? So if it was 20 degrees in this room or 22 degrees in this room, do you think you'd notice the difference? No, that's no big deal, right? Except that's a room. We're talking about an entire planet. And to give you an idea of how big two degrees is, the difference between the last ice age and the period we're experiencing now, the Holocene period, where the temperature's nice, is four degrees. If it was four degrees cooler than it was in 1800, this area would be right at the edge of the ice sheet coming down from the North Pole. That's four degrees. If we've already committed to 1.8 degrees, you can see how big of a difference that is. And that's assuming everybody actually does what they said they're going to do. How many of you believe that all the governments in the world are actually going to live up to their commitments? You're smart, okay? <laughs> that's not happening. Humans have also been impacting the world in other ways. And let's talk about the extinction crisis. Prior to modern humans, 
there have been five great extinctions caused by things like cyanobacteria releasing too much oxygen as a waste product, the great oxygenation event. Uh, we had the great dying, which was due to massive volcanic eruptions that went on for literally hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, of course, uh, the dinosaurs had a really bad day about 65 million years ago with the, Chix uh, the Chicxulub impact, right? We are now having the sixth great extinction, and it is directly tied to the activity of human beings. If you were watching the news this morning, something happened that has never before happened in human history. This morning, it was announced that for the first time ever, the crab uh, fishing season in the Bering Sea up by Alaska in the uh, northern part of Siberia has been canceled. There will be no crab fishing this year because over 1 billion, billion with a B, crabs have just disappeared. They have no idea what has happened, but when they went out and did the population check, as they do to determine how many crabs can be harvested, more than 1 billion crabs are gone. And at this point, if they had the crabbing season, they would drive this species extinct. That's how much we as humans have impacted the world. And of course, you've probably all heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So imagine an area bigger than the entire Arabian Peninsula out in the middle of the Pacific filled with floating plastic and debris. That sounds really nice to look at, doesn't it? And that's not the only one. This is the one that's really famous. There are six other gyres like that in the oceans of the world where we have put that kind of pollution. And it's not just in the oceans. It's even here on land. Back when I was teaching environmental science, we were looking at some autopsy pictures of some camels, wild camels out here in the UAE. And they had eaten so much plastic that had been littered in the desert that they starved to death because it formed a plastic ball in their stomach that they couldn't digest, so they couldn't get any real food. So imagine a plastic ball in the stomach of a camel that weighed almost as much as a human being. Okay, so we've made some pretty bad impact on the environment. And that's with 8 billion of us. But the best projections are that by 2100, there will be between 10 and 11 billion people on this planet. So that's another two to three billion. And let me put that in context, because when we're talking billions, it, you know, it's hard to imagine what a billion looks like. So if construction engineers built a city to house 1 million people every single week between now and 2100, that would only be three quarters of the amount of new housing we would need. Are we building a city of a million a week? No, so we're falling behind. And of course, these extra two to three billion people, uh, do you think they're going to want to drink water, eat food? maybe have some electronics. Yeah. Other things that we're having problems with, because of the way we've affected the climate, we're having horrific drought in parts of the world. It's changing the monsoon seasons. And of course, the opposite of that, if you've been watching the news and you've seen what's been happening in Pakistan, we've had the greatest flooding in recorded history in that country. We also have issues of poverty around the world. There's enough food to feed everybody in the world right now. But unfortunately, it's not distributed in an equal way so that everybody has food. And while you are all very blessed, you got to go to secondary school, you're now in university, you get to spend your days studying. 
there are a lot of young people, and we run a campus in Ghana, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and there are a lot of kids there who spend their entire day just walking to and from the well with buckets to get enough water for their family instead of getting an education, or they're food insecure and they have to go and stand in line to get food from charitable organizations. And of course, huge amounts of pollution. It's not just the ocean, it's all over the world. If you look at the amount of pollution, it's staggering. Uh, the UAE, it's a wonderful place to live. We do have a lot of cleanup activities here. And in general, I find people here pollute less than a lot of other places I've lived, but still there's a lot further we can go. So if everybody decided to live like Americans, people from the US, we'd be in trouble. See, the United States has been really, really good at convincing everybody that's the way everyone should live between TV shows and movies and songs and things like that. Well, the problem is with 8 billion people, if everybody lived that way, we would need five of Earth just to supply enough resources. Uh, do any of you happen to have four additional Earths maybe in your shed or no? We can't do that. So if we want to survive into the future, we all have to get down to the point where we're using about as many resources as people in India are currently. Because remember, this is based on 8 billion people. When we add 3 billion more, if we were at China, we'd need one and a half Earth. So we've got to get down to the level of the resources people use in India. And you might be thinking, you know, wow, you know, I don't want that lifestyle, right? I lived and worked in India for three years. Um, you might be thinking, well, you don't want that lifestyle. That doesn't mean we have to live that lifestyle. It means that we have to create a circular economy where as resources are used, they go back into the start of the cycle and are used as raw materials. So there's no waste falling out of the cycle. Everything is reused over and over again. And it is possible, technological salvation, for us to get to the point where we can all be using that little resources and still be enjoying living a lifestyle that we'd feel comfortable with. Okay, so I don't want you to feel like it's hopeless. It's not. It's the creativity of the ideas that you're going to come up with that can help lead us to this. So in order to help us get there, the UN developed the Sustainable Development Goals. And these are a replacement for what used to be called the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals ideally were going to be implemented within the first 10 to 15 years of the new millennium. We've passed that. It's unfortunate that we need these. Had all of the Millennium Development Goals been carried out, we wouldn't need this. We wouldn't be having this conversation, but they weren't. Now the Sustainable Development Goals, this is probably the last set of these goals that the UN's ever going to come out with because either we accomplish these goals or there's not going to be a civilized world for us to even talk about things like this, okay? So we've got some pressure here, but we can do it. So I'm going to go through each one of the goals and talk a little bit about it. Now, the reason I wanna focus on these, besides the fact that it's good for you to know about, is the case studies that you're going to be working on in this Business Cup Challenge are about solving or addressing these goals. So as you understand the goal better, you'll be able to better come up with a case solution for your team. Okay, so goal number one is no poverty. And the definition of poverty isn't what you think. Most people, when they think of poverty, it's like, you know, goodness, you can't even buy the current generation of smartphone, right? We're talking about people who make less than two US dollars a day, about seven Durham's. Think about it. How many of you already spent that much on coffee this morning, <laughs> right? Okay. This is real poverty. 
but there's over 1 billion people on this planet who fall into this category of poverty. And we need to alleviate that poverty. Part of that means that we've got to provide crucial services to these people at no cost to them. So crucial services, water, food, sanitation, education, healthcare, and electricity. So we've got to come up with some really creative solutions. Now, I know nothing is free, right? So the creative solution here has to be something that can generate money in one side and then fund being able to provide this for the people who can't afford it and raise them out of poverty. Now, I don't want to, to be a downer on everything. So you need to know that if we go back 50 years, roughly half of the world's population fit into the category of severely impoverished. At this point, it's less than 13%. So we have made a tremendous amount of progress. We just need to push it a little further to get over the line so that there is no poverty. The second is zero hunger. If you look across the world, about 1.5 billion people are what is called food insecure. That means they don't know where the next meal is coming from, or even if there's going to be a next meal. Now, all of you are blessed. You know, you get up in the morning, you have breakfast, you have lunch, you have dinner. Um, those of you who practice fasting during Ramadan, you probably have a little better idea what it means to feel hungry. And that's part of the purpose is so that you will have that feeling of charity toward others. So it's important to understand that there are a lot of people who it's not just during one month of the year, that's their whole life. So we need to address that. We also need to make sure that it's a proper nutritional balance. So you might think, okay, quick solution to this, we grab a couple billion tons of rice out of China and we send it to Sub-Saharan Africa, we're done, right? White rice is not nutritionally complete. In fact, it's got a really high glycemic index that will give you high blood sugar and type two diabetes if that's all you're eating. So we need to make sure that what is being provided to people, it's not only grains, but lentils and beans and vegetables so that they have proper nutrition. Can you believe that in this world, there are still hundreds of thousands of children a year who go blind because they don't get enough vitamin A. So in, in the 21st century, we still have people literally going blind over a vitamin that was discovered almost 200 years ago. Okay, so we need proper nutrition. Now, on the other hand, we need to think beyond just the narrow limits of zero hunger. We have an interesting problem in the world where there's about 1.5 billion people who don't have enough to eat, we also have the greatest percentage of obesity in the history of humankind. There are over 2 billion people in this world who are clinically obese. And you might be thinking, well, at least they've got enough to eat, right? They're, they're uh, getting enough nutrition. Unfortunately, nope. The reason that they're obese is because they're not getting the right nutrition. And I want to tell you something. You've been lied to. If you go back to the late 1960s, early 1970s, the companies that make sugar or sugar substitutes like high fructose corn syrup, things like that, knew from their own scientific studies that eating excessive amounts of sugar not only caused type 2 diabetes, but also caused heart disease and stroke and obesity and a number of other uh, issues. They actually paid off some scientists to do research to show that it was fat. That's where the problem, right? 
you've probably heard this, you know, you avoid a high fat, high cholesterol diet because that would give you heart disease. Bull, that's wrong. Okay, the scientific evidence does not support that at all. You can eat a high fat, even a high cholesterol diet and not end up with heart disease if you don't eat sugar. But if you eat sugar, you're going to end up with that. So for decades, these corporations actually got the government to put out food guides telling you to eat high carbs and to avoid fats and obesity and heart disease and strokes and diabetes have gone through the roof. Okay, so you need to understand that the standard American diet, the, we call it SAD, is really bad for you. And if that's what we're exporting around the world to alleviate hunger, all we're going to do is create medical problems. There are actually places in Sub-Saharan Africa where in their entire history, they have never had anybody have heart disease. Can you imagine that? The number one killer in the world and there are places where nobody has it and nobody has had it in over a hundred years. It's because of what they eat, okay? So we need to consider that when we're looking at a solution around this because unfortunately, corporations will lie to you. And when you're considering how do we get these things implemented, you need to understand that you can't do it through governments. You would think that it was a government's responsibility to do the right thing for its citizens, right? Yes? You know, the 16th president of the US, Abraham Lincoln said, you know, the government of the people, by the people and for the people. That's a fantastic idea. It's just not reality anymore because there are corporations that are so big that they have earnings that are more than entire countries. And they have been able to capture the governments. So the only way that you're going to get a solution that works is if you can work it through the companies because the companies will make sure no matter what they need to do, including outright lying and creating false scientific studies to make as much money as they can. So in your solution, you need to think about how do you make this so that it is financially viable for corporations? Because only then will they do it. And there are really two ways that that comes into play. So the first way is when it becomes more cost effective. So think about solar energy. You go back 20 years ago, solar energy was more expensive than coal or natural gas. Now, solar energy is roughly the same or a little bit cheaper, except what's happening in Europe, right? With the war in Ukraine, the price of natural gas has now gone up about four or five times. So now corporations are suddenly really interested in green energy because it costs a quarter or 20% of what it would cost to continue to use fossil fuels. So the first way you can make your solution work is if you make it financially viable. The second way you can make your solution work is if it involves the most powerful force on any company, customers. You see, if you don't buy from companies based on what they're doing to the environment, they will change because they've got to have sales to survive. So just like the companies are able to force the government to do what they want, you voting with your money can force the companies to do what you want. And then it's very interesting how it plays out. So let's say that you decide to vote with your money and you go after a big company, the leader in a particular industry, and you put pressure on them to change to be more environmentally sustainable. As soon as they realize they're going to have to do this or they're not going to be able to survive as a company, they'll go to the government and they'll say, uh, government, you need to make a law so that everybody has to do this. And you might be thinking, why? 
it levels the playing field. If they're going to have to be doing something that's not quite as profitable in order to keep you as a customer, they want to make sure everybody else has to do the same thing. And suddenly, instead of the corporations being against what you're doing, they're now forcing the government to require what you want done. You have the power. You need to remember that. Where you spend your money tells corporations what you want them to do. Okay, so let's talk about good health and well being. All of you would like to be healthy? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Well, we need to reduce or eliminate endemic and chronic diseases. You've all, as you were growing up, probably watched one of the 10 most deadly videos, right? You know, 10 most deadly animals, things like that. Anybody know what the most deadly animal in the entire world is? It's a mosquito. Mosquitoes kill more people every year than any other creature on this planet. And they do it with diseases like malaria. Now, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been doing a fantastic job. They've actually supported research that has come up with the first malaria vaccine in human history. And it works. It's about 70% effective, but at least it works. And it's starting to be rolled out. There's more work that needs to be done, but we can eventually rid the world of diseases that have plagued humankind as long as we've existed. And then there's chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, right? Or as uh, Dr. Robert Lustig from the University of California, San Francisco calls it, processed food disease. See, when we eat food that is high in salt, and high in sugar, we actually are destroying our internal systems. And if we do it long enough, which could be as early as your 30s, you end up with type 2 diabetes, and then all of the nasty things that follow on from that. And if you look at the cost of this as a healthcare burden on the world, it's phenomenally huge. So we have to address this in order to have money for other things, and also to make people feel good. Who wants to have diabetes, right? We need to reduce childhood mortality. You've probably heard that back in like 1800, the average lifespan was 42 years. And you might be thinking, you know, wow, people didn't live very long. Well, actually, people still live to be 80, 90, 100 years old. The reason the average was so low was because children tended to die before they hit their fifth birthday. And back then, if you wanted to have one or two children make it to adult age, you usually had to have four to six children just to guarantee at least one of them would survive. Now, we have been doing a fantastic job on reducing childhood mortality. At this point, the average lifespan around the world is up around 75 years of age. So we've done a great job there. Interestingly, though, we've turned a corner. Childhood mortality started going up again in the late 2010s. And you might be thinking, well, why is that? Well, part of it is poverty, food insecurity, children not being able to get vaccines. Sadly, part of it is people believing pseudoscientific nonsense and being against vaccines. We actually have, for the first time in over 50 years, polio outbreaks in New York City, right? Polio had been driven literally to the brink of extinction. There were literally two places, one in Nigeria, way out in the sticks in Nigeria, and part of Afghanistan. Those were the only two places on earth that polio still existed. And we were this close to having completely wiped it out. Now there's a uh, area of New York City where there's a lot of rich people who are against vaccines and they're having a polio outbreak there. And it could come back and be a problem for all of us. So we need to focus on how do we reduce childhood mortality. 
and then increasing healthy lifespan. So how many of you would like to live to be 100? A few, really, okay. I'm going for 125, I just wanna let you know. Um, now, for those who said you want to live to be 100, would you still feel the same if the last 50 years of your life you were bedridden? No, not at all. Nobody would want that, right? Okay, so what we're looking at is not just increasing lifespan, we're looking at increasing health span. How long can we live and be truly healthy and productive and enjoy life? So we're focusing on that. And a lot of that comes down to eating the right things, getting enough sleep, getting enough exercise. At this point, there is no reason that most people can't live to be at least 80 and be healthy at least until they're 75, 78. And if they live really well, even longer than that. Okay, quality education. Now, all of you are in university. You're getting a quality education. The UAE is absolutely fantastic for education between the Ministry of Education and KHDA good guarantee of quality. But this isn't true all over the world. Not everybody has been as fortunate as you. So we need to make sure that education through secondary school is available at no cost to all families worldwide to give people an equal chance at doing something for the world. You know, we don't want the next Einstein to never get a chance to even go past primary school because the parents couldn't afford it. Who knows what we might prevent ourselves from benefiting from. And we need to make sure that all of the education meets international standards for quality. Gender equality. We need to make sure that male or female, doesn't matter, everybody has equal rights and equal opportunities. It's only fair, right? There was a great quote from Gandhi. He said, you know, how can we be against women when they hold up half the sky, right? If any of you here not have a mother? Of course not. Mothers are pretty important. You wouldn't be here otherwise. So we need to give equal rights and equal opportunities to both genders. And that means equal pay for equal work. Right now, even in the most developed countries, women make about 86 cents against every dollar that men make in the same job. And progress has been made, but at this rate, it was estimated in the UK, it would take 137 years before it would be equal. We cannot wait 137 years. We shouldn't have had to wait this long. So that needs to be a focus, making sure that everybody gets the same pay for the same work. Clean water and sanitation. This is huge. If you've been reading the news recently, you probably heard that in Haiti, they're actually having a massive outbreak of cholera. Now, we know how to fix cholera. It's literally just good sanitation systems and cholera goes away. But yet, in a modern country, we're still having this. So we need to make sure that around the world, everybody has clean drinkable water. And notice I said at each home, because in Ghana, there are children who literally spend their entire day walking back and forth several kilometers each way to the well, carrying water. They don't get time to go to school. If they don't do that, their family doesn't have water, their family doesn't survive. So they have to do this. We also have to have sanitary toilet facilities at every home so that we don't get these cholera outbreaks and things like that. Affordable and clean energy. So we need to get to the point where all energy production in the world is carbon neutral. We cannot afford to keep putting more carbon into the atmosphere because even if we achieve the COP26 agreements, we're still at 1.8 degrees. And that very likely may pass a tipping point. And if we pass 
the right tipping points and we get up to let's say three degrees at three degrees there's no ice on greenland the greenland ice sheet's gone there's no ice on antarctica there's no ice at the north pole all of the glaciers that are currently in the mountains around the world are gone and by the way sea level rise will be about 30 meters which means where we are sitting right now you would need scuba gear yeah dubai would be gone as would uh, the maldives if you'd like to see that i would suggest you go within the next 20 years because it's already going underwater and there are many other parts of the world where this is going to happen Currently, we're looking to affect about 2 billion people just with the sea level rise we've already committed to, not the 30 meters. So we've got to get carbon neutral. And it has to be affordable to everybody. Everybody should have access to energy because if you don't have energy, it is extremely unlikely you're ever going to pull yourself out of poverty. So we've got to get to that point. We need decent, decent work and economic growth for everybody. So we need to have paid work available for all adults. Now, if you think about what you've heard in the news, and it sounds exciting, right? We've got AI coming along and we've got robotics, you know, they're going to do these incredible things. They're also going to put a huge number of people out of work by taking their jobs. So do you think it, it sounds like a good idea that uh, Bezos and Musk and Zuckerberg and uh, Gates, you know, they, they've got these AI systems and robotic systems, and all of us become disposable humans because there's no work for us to do. Does that sound like a world you'd want to live in? No. So we've got to make sure that there is work available for all adults and that there is no child labor or slavery. There's a website called walkfree.org and it gives you an idea of slavery in the world right now. There are over 200 million people worldwide who are slaves at this point. And any of you think you'd like to contribute to slavery? Think that's something you'd wanna be involved in? No? You all have smartphones? Laptops, big screen TVs, guess what? You're involved in slavery. Because one of the core elements that's required to make those is cobalt. Cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's the largest place. And in the DRC, you have children as young as four years old being used to get cobalt out of the ground and living as slaves. So remember when I talked about you being able to vote with your wallet? Well, this is a place you can do that. You can let the companies that you're buying from know that you're, you're not going to buy more product from them unless they figure out a way to get around this. And you know what? The solution isn't even that hard. Would you be willing to pay, say, $5 more for your next smartphone if it eliminated slavery? That's all it would take. About a $5 increase would be enough to make it so that the DRC could make the same amount of money without having to use slavery or child labor. So again, it's a chance for you to vote with your money. And we need safe working conditions for all. Unfortunately, a lot of work gets sent off to countries where they have unsafe working conditions. And again, you can vote with your money and you can force companies not to do that. <clears throat> and a livable wage for all. That's part of eliminating poverty. Everybody should get paid enough money that they can live a reasonable life. And again, it doesn't greatly increase the prices of anything that you and I are buying, but it makes a world of difference for them. We need industry innovation and infrastructure. So around the world, there's a huge need for infrastructure. And you see uh, countries like China with their Belt and Road Initiative have been contributing to this, but it's going to take a lot more. We also need to build industry in 
countries that are less developed so that they can become more developed and everybody can have jobs and get out of poverty. And all of that is going to take a lot of innovation like you're going to put into this contest. So we need to develop all of this industry and innovation in less developed countries. And you might be thinking, well, where's the money for that going to come, right? It's a good question. Well, I'll tell you where it should come from, the more developed countries. You know how they became the more developed countries? They were empires. They exploited the less developed countries. They stole the resources. They put people into slavery. They exploited these countries, sometimes for hundreds of years. It's time to pay back. It is completely immoral that these countries are not contributing the money to raise the level of these less developed countries and to create an equal playing field. And as individuals, we can apply pressure to industries and businesses to help them support the SDGs. We can vote with our money. We need to reduce inequalities. Now, I'd mentioned to you that there's roughly 8 billion people on this planet right now. Would you be shocked to know that there are 16,000 people on this planet who have wealth, net worth, equal to the other 8 billion of us put together? Does that seem fair? I mean, think about 16,000 people. That's about one quarter of the number of people it would take to fill up a typical football stadium have more wealth than eight, eight billion other people. So we need to address this. We need to reduce the income inequalities as well. So that was the wealth inequalities. Let's talk about income inequality. The top 1% of earners in the world in 2015 crossed over so that they make more than the other 99% combined. And that was in 2015, and it's actually gotten worse from there. During the COVID pandemic, when so many people were losing their jobs, having their income reduced, there were more new billionaires than any other two-year period in the history of humanity. This is a huge problem. And how does this happen? Well, there's a, a great line. Behind every great fortune, is a great crime. And if you look at what a lot of these companies have done, they're exploiting people, they're doing things, corrupting government and things like that, that allow them to make this kind of money. We also need to reduce the inequalities between countries. And I talked about how the more developed countries need to give back what they stole to the less developed countries to equal things out. We need sustainable cities and communities. That's goal 11. So every community or city needs to have food independence so they don't have to import food, water independence so they have enough clean water on their own, energy independence so they're not having to import electricity, and services independence so they've got enough educational services and enough medical services to care for their own community. Goal number 12 is responsible consumption and production. And we already talked about how if everybody lived like people in the US, we'd need five of Earth. It's not going to work. So we need to make sure that everything that we are buying is carbon neutral or carbon negative. And we also need to avoid what are called forever chemicals. Now, we as human beings did a great job through the late 1970s and 80s and 90s on dealing with chlorofluorocarbons. These are the chemicals that were wiping out the ozone layer, which is kind of important because without it, we'd all die. We've pretty much eliminated CFCs from the world, but they did a study last year. They looked at blood tests from people all over the world, even the most remote islands out in the middle of the Pacific Every single blood sample had forever chemicals in it. These are industrial chemicals that nature cannot break down. And unfortunately, they're in our food supply now. And 
they know what some of them do. A lot of them are cancer causing. Others, they don't even know yet what they do to us. And then reduction of waste. We have to get to the point where our entire economy is circular. That means every waste product that comes out of our economy goes back in as a raw material to make the next generation. If we do that, we can all continue to live a lifestyle we feel comfortable with without needing five planets to do it. And then the elimination of overconsumption. We need to ask ourselves, you know, do I really need that new smartphone? Yeah, it's got a camera that's you know, two megapixels better. Is it really worth that? We need to start really looking realistically at what we're buying. Climate action. This one's huge. We've got to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we've all heard about carbon dioxide, right? That's the big bad gas that everybody talks about. Did you know that's not the worst greenhouse gas? We talk about CO2 because it's a very powerful greenhouse gas and it lasts a long, long time. CO2 can last hundreds of years in the atmosphere before it finally breaks down. But there's another greenhouse gas that is even stronger, methane. So if you've been watching the news about two weeks ago, the Nord Stream pipeline got blown up and there were billions of kilograms of methane that escaped into the atmosphere. So what did that do to us? Well, that reduced the budget of carbon dioxide we can put into the atmosphere before we hit those tipping points. Because methane is more than 100 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas. It just goes away faster. It only takes 10 or 15 years to break down. But the thing is, with all that methane that's just been released, that means for the next 10 or 15 years, we're that much closer to hitting the tipping point and we could push ourselves over with our carbon dioxide. The other thing that you probably didn't know is that each one of you by what you eat makes a huge contribution to global warming. Diet is climate. And there's actually a book about this Depending on which study you look at, between 40 and 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions can be tied back to the agricultural industry and specifically tied back to producing meat. The reality is the industry of producing meat the way that we do now is completely unsustainable. And it is the biggest single driver of creating climate change. So you, you might think, well, okay, I just won't take you know, international airline flights. If you're eating, let's say beef two days a week over a year, you're going to have caused the release of more greenhouse gases than if you took an international flight every single month. So something to think about. We need to reduce emissions of all of the other pollutants too. We've got the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We've got pollution on land. We need to address that. We can't afford to pollute because all of those pollutants need to be the inputs to the next cycle of production. And we already know that we're committed to a certain level of climate change. So we need to be looking at how do we abate that? How do we stop or deal with the floods in Pakistan? How do we keep the Maldives from going underwater? How do we keep Bangladesh from going underwater? Things like that. Life below water. I started off talking about 1 billion crabs just having disappeared, probably died off. So we've got to eliminate overfishing. At this point, human beings have overfished essentially every species in the ocean. And there's one in particular that's really set to cause us problems, sharks. Most shark fishing is done for the Chinese market, for shark fin soup, okay? Which is weird because shark fin is cartilage. It's essentially the same stuff as your fingernails and your hair. 
Um, any of you up for a bowl of hare soup? That's what shark fin soup is. Okay, let's be real with each other. So sharks are the apex predator. And when you take an apex predator out of an environment, it creates a little problem. It lets the other species in that environment go crazy with reproduction. They did this in Yellowstone National Park. They got rid of all of the wolves and they had an overrun of deer. It wiped out whole environments and other species. They finally had to reintroduce the wolves and that got the environment back under control. They've modeled what happens if sharks are gone. Do you all like jellyfish? No, they're definitely not good to eat, um, not fun to swim with either. If we get rid of the sharks, the oceans within about 30 years will be dominated by jellyfish because of the cascade of not having the apex predator. Okay, so we need to eliminate overfishing and of course, work on extinction prevention. Make sure that we're not driving any particular species to extinction and prevent or clean up the pollution that we put in the oceans. And it's not just the plastic. Going back to agriculture, because of the way that companies like Arthur Daniel Midland and Calgill do their farming, we put a huge amount of fertilizer into the water. And most species in the oceans live near the coast. Well, what happens when that fertilizer gets into the water is you get an algal bloom. You get algae blooming all over the place. And when it dies, it absorbs the oxygen in the water and you end up with the dead zone. And all of the other species that were living there die because there's no oxygen. Then we need to look at life on land. And we've got a similar problem with topsoil. Topsoil is the layer of the ground where we can actually grow the food we need. But because of industrial farming and the way that it's been done, the topsoil in the world has decreased by 95%. And we are actually getting desertification where the ground no longer will grow food. We can't afford that if we're increasing the world's population by 3 billion. And it literally comes down to just changing the way farming is done. If you plant just corn, a single crop, it depletes the nitrogen and other resources from the soil, and you end up with dirt that you can't grow anything in. But if you plant corn, and then at the base of the corn, you plant beans, beans fix the nitrogen from the air into the ground, and the soil stays healthy. So it's not that we need to stop farming, we just need to do it the way our ancestors used to do it, when the topsoil was fine. We need to reverse desertification. The Sahara Desert, the Gobi Desert are getting bigger. Uh, China's actually been doing a great job of stopping the advance of the Gobi Desert and taking some of it back. And there's some efforts in Sub-Saharan Africa to do the same thing. So we need to focus on stopping the desert because as the land becomes desert, it actually increases the level of global warming. That's one of those tipping points. And of course, preventing extinction of land species and dealing with the pollution so that we're not polluting our environment. Goal number 16 is peace, justice, and strong institutions. And you might think, well, what does that have to do with being sustainable? Well, if people don't feel safe, if people don't feel like they have recourse, if something happens, then their focus is on maintaining their safety and their livelihood, not on fixing the problems we need to in the world. So we need this in order to do all of the other ones. So this includes ensuring peace locally and globally. And I want to use the uh, current war in Ukraine is an example. So besides the fact that there is horrific devastation, that horrible things are happening, and that hundreds of thousands of people have been killed or injured, which that should be enough of a reason not to do this. 
if you look at it from an environmental standpoint, the fires that have been caused have been putting huge amounts of pollutants in the atmosphere. The explosion on the Nord Stream pipeline released billions of tons of methane gas into the atmosphere. And there is the potential that there could even be issues with radiation if Putin uses a tactical nuclear weapon or decides to blow up one of the nuclear power plants that's there. So we need peace to ensure that the environment stays well. We also need to ensure that there's justice in human rights. Again, if people don't feel safe, they're going to be investing their efforts in that, not in fixing the world's problems. We also need to eliminate corruption. Corruption is what allows a lot of these things to go on. But before you come down too hard on corruption, I want you to think about why do people do it? And I'm not talking about the billionaires being corrupt and getting government to do things for their corporations. I'm talking about the person on the street, you know, the police officer who wants some lunch money or you know, things like that. Well, people do this because they don't have a livable wage. If they were actually being paid a livable wage, they wouldn't need to do that. It's not that they're evil people that they want to do this, but they want to be able to put food on the table for their family. So if we go back to eliminating poverty and having equal pay for equal work and livable wages for everybody, that goes a long way toward getting rid of that kind of corruption. And we need robust institutions, both at the local, the national, and at the international level to make sure this is enforced. And then the final goal is partnerships. So we need to incentivize governments to participate in the sustainable development goals. And how do we incentivize governments? Well, in some countries you do it by voting, but I think everybody has seen with what's happened in the United States recently that voting doesn't necessarily mean you get the right person in office. So how do you do it when it's a government of the corporations, by the corporations and for the corporations? Well, you incentivize the businesses and that comes down to each of you voting with your money and letting companies know what you will and won't accept, then they will get the government to do what they need to. And then what we're doing today, which is talking to people about how each of us can contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals. And I'm hoping that from this walkthrough that we just did on these 17 goals, you've gotten some ideas of what you can do to make the world a better place because it's your generation that's going to have to save the planet, not only for all of you, but for people like me too. So now let's talk about how this works into the Business Cup Challenge this year. Okay, so starting on October 20th, there'll be a new case study every Thursday. Now in your case, there's one case study and then the final case study. We'll expect the case study back from you by the following Thursday. And then by Monday after that, we'll give you feedback and we'll give you detailed feedback on your case. It's not just a, a numeric mark because that doesn't help you. What helps is getting professors who actually give you some detailed feedback on what you suggested, how you could improve it, why it might be a challenge, things like that. Um, when you're submitting it, if you submit it as a document, like an essay, not more than 2,000 words and two pages additionally of charts and graphs if you want to. You can submit it in any format. It can be a Word document, PowerPoint, Prezi, a spreadsheet, whatever you want. You can even do it as an audio or video file. Just please keep it to five minutes. Okay. The ideas that you give in solving the case have to be related to what the case study is about. So if it's about a specific business, about that, and then also related to one or more of the strategic or sustainable development goals, okay? And it also has to be actually possible, no violating the laws of physics, okay? Uh, you do not need to go into technical details. You know, if you're talking about using Pescovite 
solar cells. You don't have to be able to explain that to us. We know what that is. You just talk about your concept. You need to show how this is going to be sustainable. So how much approximately will it cost to do what you're suggesting? And then how long will it take to pay back in terms of either revenue or savings? Because as we've talked about, businesses are only going to do things when they see a financial incentive to do so. And you also need to include a pestle analysis. So looking at the political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal impacts, and look at it from two angles. One angle is how do these six criteria drive your solution? How do they motivate your solution? And how do they constrain your solution? So for example, you know, technologically, right now solar cells don't go beyond about 28% efficiency for commercially available cells. So you can't have a proposal for 60% efficient solar cells. That just doesn't work. So that's a constraint. On the other hand, there can be things that are really driving your solution, like the increase in global temperature. That may be a driver of why your solution is needed. Okay, so you need to consider both ways. Some of these six will be just drivers, some will be just constraints, and some may actually be both. Okay. And you should also consider existing and future competitors. Just because there's somebody already in the industry that you're talking about doesn't mean that's not a good idea. It may be that you can build on what they're doing or maybe even synergize with them and come up with an even better solution together. So after the first case, the top five teams on the leaderboard, they get the golden buzzer. They get to go straight through to the final. Then for the second week, we'll release the final case to everybody. And those who are not in the top five teams will also get a second case for doing an elevator pitch. So an elevator pitch is simply, imagine you're at the Burj Khalifa, you've stepped onto the elevator and you're all by yourself. And just as the door's closing, Elon Musk steps onto the lift with you and the door closes. You now have his undivided attention for 40 seconds. Now you can't give him a pitch that will get him to invest in 40 seconds, but you can give him a pitch that will interest him enough that he's like, why don't you come to my office and give me a full description of this? That's what you're trying to do with this elevator pitch, right? So on November 5th at the finals, everybody who was not in the top five teams gets to give their elevator pitch strict 40 second time limit and the top five elevator pitches then go on to the final case round so i will tell you please make sure that you prepare both the elevator pitch and your final case because there's nothing more embarrassing than winning the elevator pitch round and being told you get to go on to the final and being like but we didn't prepare a case right don't go in expecting to lose right? You need to go in expecting you're going to win the elevator pitch. Uh, there's an old expression, you know, confidence is when you go out on a boat hunting for Moby Dick and you bring the tartar sauce with you, okay? You need to go into this competition in it to win it, preparing and being ready for your final case. So the final case, you can present it any way that you like. The stage is yours. And you can do it maybe just with a video where nobody on your team says anything, you just play the video, that's fine. You can have one person get up as the spokesperson who gives your entire case, or you can pass it around from one team member to another. Entirely your choice, you're not being judged on the presentation, you're being judged on the ideas, okay? Strict 10 minute time limit, so, if you want to win this, you need to practice. So with your elevator pitch, 
practice it over and over again, and it's only one person because 40 seconds is not enough time to pass from one to the other, that person needs to be able to give the elevator pitch in 35 seconds. Give yourself a five second buffer because it's better to be five seconds under than five over because we don't count anything after 40 seconds. Same thing with your final case pitch. You get 10 minutes. Anything you say after that alarm goes off does not count. So you need to make sure that you've practiced it over and over again, and you can consistently do it in like 9.30 or 9.40, not longer than that. So you've got a little bit of buffer. The judges will determine first, second, and third place and have prizes for the top three finishers and your uh, university mentor, whoever is mentoring your team. Okay. So that's all of it. And now uh, questions. Thank you so much.